and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text which we read a few moments ago in the book of Exodus. We've been here for quite some weeks looking at Exodus chapter 3 because it gives us a very good overview of the way in which God works when he calls his people to serve him. And we have been paralleling it with those things which God has placed upon us today to do, Things that not only we must believe, but things that we must do. The Christian life is not merely an issue of doctrine, although that is essential as a foundation. But the Christian life is composed of that which we must do based upon the truth that we believe. If you believe the truth, it is not a matter of head knowledge. It is a matter of obedience. And how often we miss that in the Christian life. How essential it is for us to take what we have learned theologically and put shoe leather on it. Going out and carrying the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ and sound doctrine to those who are around us. Now you recall that as we saw God empowered Moses here, he not only called him but he empowered him so God has likewise empowered us to the new job that he has called us to do. We discover as we look at the New Testament that there were multiple spiritual gifts that were given as the church in her infancy got started on the day of Pentecost and a new work of the Spirit began. The Holy Spirit, of course, is omnipresent. He was always here, always in the world, but we see that in the Old Testament he did a different kind of a work where he would come upon people temporarily with supernatural empowerments and then he would leave them. And that's why David 
prays in the Psalms, Lord, take not thy spirit from me. But that's not a biblical prayer for us today because Jesus promised that when the Holy Spirit would come and indwell us, he would abide with us forever, even the spirit of truth. We now have the blessing of having the permanently indwelling Holy Spirit of God. And I should emphasize holy because if you are motivated to do something that is not holy, no matter how reasonable it seems, it is not from the Spirit of God. If you are motivated ever to do anything that is contrary to the Word of God, it is not from the Spirit of God, for the Spirit of God inspired the Scriptures. He is the moving agent Holy men of old were carried along. They were moved. It's a special word there in Peter. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. It's an irresistible movement. When the word of God was exhaled by God, Theopneustos, God breathed, given by inspiration, 2 Timothy 3.16, the Holy Spirit took those men through whom he was giving the scripture and controlled it so that every precise word was indeed the word of God to us. We need to remember that. And there is a very important effect to that because it comes through in the area of what we call practical theology. And God gave us, at that time, different divine enablements given to individual believers and those believers thus being given to the church to edify, that is to build up the church, the body of Christ. Believers themselves are God's gift to the church, and thus the gifts are not for our own personal selfish use. Now last week we covered the seven temporary or seven sign gifts that God gave during the apostolic period before the completion of the New Testament canon, that is, before all the New Testament books were written. There were certain spiritual gifts that were only given during that period. Those were the gifts of apostle, prophet, healings, miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and knowledge. Now God still does miraculous things today. We heard about some of those that took place in Baalah. But the gift of miracles, which was given to an individual man to be able to perform miracles, ceased with the completion of the canon of scripture. These apostolic gifts were designed to authenticate the message that was being given through the apostles and prophets. And that is what we have in the New Testament today. But with the completion of the book of Revelation, probably about 96 AD, those miraculous gifts ceased. However, God has also given to us additional gifts as well. There are the service gifts, and that's what we want to begin looking at today. There are 15 different service gifts that God has given to the church so that we might, as is explained in Ephesians chapter 4, one of the main passages dealing with the spiritual gifts, so that we might edify and build up the body of Christ. The gifts that we looked at last week, very briefly, the gift of apostles that was given to men. There were no women apostles who had seen and been taught by the resurrected Christ, and they had all of the other spiritual gifts, these were the men who were given to found the church at its inception. We noticed also that there was the gift of prophet. The gift of prophet was a temporary gift during the apostolic period that enabled a man, not a woman, but a man, to receive and proclaim new special revelation concerning God's will in the past, present, and future, for the edification, exhortation, and comfort of the saints. That's specifically stated for us in the New Testament. The gift of healings was a temporary gift given to the apostles and prophets to authenticate their message in founding the church before the close of the New Testament canon. And we noted that the gift of miracles was not the same thing as the gift of healings. For example, when Elymas the sorcerer is struck blind by the apostle Paul, that's the gift of miracles. It's definitely not a gift of healings. The gift of healings given so that as the men who had that gift were giving the word of God, it would indeed prove that what they were saying was true. But it could not always be exercised. Paul had the gift of healings, but he speaks about how he left Trophimus at Miletum sick. Various times where Paul gives indication of the fact that he himself had a, an eyesight problem and he couldn't heal himself. 
because that would not have been necessary for the purpose for which that gift was given. The gift of tongues was a temporary, miraculous linguistic ability that enabled a man to speak real human languages, which he had never learned, as an evangelistic sign to unbelieving Jews. The, the thing that you see going on today in so-called charismatic churches is not the New Testament gift of tongues. It violates all of the rules that the Apostle uh, Paul gives in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, where he explains exactly how it was to be used in the early church. You do not see those, and we didn't go into great detail, but you do not see those same requirements being exercised today. For example, the women were not allowed to speak in church, uh, so they could not have the gift of tongues, and yet you see they are the primary ones that carry it forward today in the charismatic movement. It had to be, at the most, two or three, and that by course, that is, one after another. And then somebody had to translate it. It's a gift of languages. There are 18 different languages or dialects that are mentioned in Acts chapter 1, where we see it first appearing, and it appears in that same way as we look through the New Testament. There are those who say, well, but he says, Paul says, if I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and we're speaking an angelic language. Just remember that every time, without exception, every time that angels appear to men, they speak human languages. They don't gibberish. So the gift of tongues was a temporary gift, which was used to communicate the gospel to those who had not heard it in their own language. And it is the Jews who require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom. There was a sign that was prophesied in the book of Isaiah and a sign that was given so that Jews who spoke foreign languages could hear the gospel in their own language. Far cry from what is going on in charismatic churches today. Interpretation of tongues, that's a miraculous gift whereby that language would be translated so that the local assembly would understand what was going on. Paul explains, he says, if, if I come to you speaking in tongues uh, and you don't understand it, what good is it? I'd rather speak five words um, that you can understand than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. 10,000 words is a lot of words, folks. You can get 300 type words per page. I can read about one page in four minutes. So you figure that out the math yourself. Paul says, I'd rather not give a huge long discourse, even if it's from God, if you don't understand it. Rather speak five words in a language that you can understand. So the gift of interpretation was a miraculous temporary spiritual gift, always related to the gift of tongues, which enabled a man to understand and translate human languages previously unlearned by him. And then we talked about the gift of knowledge, which is connected to those other temporary gifts, the gift of knowledge was the reception of new special revelation concerning the 17 New Testament mysteries. If you go through the New Testament, you find that there are 17 things that are newly taught in the New Testament that you don't find in the Old Testament. And the Apostle Paul explains that over in Ephesians chapter 3 and 4, where he explains that uh, a mystery is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament, but is now revealed unto the apostles and prophets by the Spirit. The gift of knowledge was that ability to receive new special revelation so that the questions that arose in the early church prior to the completion of the New Testament, so that those questions could be answered authoritatively. But now we have the completed New Testament, and so the gift of knowledge has ceased. And we find that explained to us by the Apostle Paul in the great love chapter in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, where he talks about the gift of knowledge, the gift of tongues, and the gift of prophecy. And that when those, the gift of uh, prophecy and the gift of knowledge were turned off by the Spirit of God, tongues would, and it's in what's called the middle voice in Greek, I'll not give you a Greek lesson here, but that means that tongues would cease in and of themselves. The other two were the controlling gifts, and tongues was merely a connecting link to other languages. And so when the Holy Spirit ceased giving the gift of knowledge and the gift of prophecy, which related to that new revelation, once the scriptures were completed, tongues would cease in and of themselves. And so those are the seven temporary gifts that we see. But today the church has the remaining 15 service gifts, the gift of evangelist, the gift of pastor-teacher, the gift of teacher, the gift of governments, the gift of ruling, the gift of helps, the gift of faith, the gift of wisdom, the gift of self-control, 
the gift of discerning of spirits, and as we said before last week, that has nothing to do with looking at somebody's bloodshot eyes and declaring them to be demon-possessed. That's not what this is about. The gift of giving, the gift of ministration, the gift of exhortation, the gift of mercy, and the gift of hospitality. The special technical term for the spiritual gifts is used of each of those 15 different things uh, which I have just mentioned. Some of those gifts are what we call every believer gifts. We discover that some of them are in fact given to every believer. For example, the gift of faith. You were given faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 10 makes that very clear. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The nearest antecedent to verse 8 is faith. That, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. What? Faith. That is what he has just been talking about. So the gift of faith is given to every believer. Some have a larger portion of faith, and Paul explains that over in uh, Romans chapter 12, but that is a, what we call an every believer gift. You wouldn't be in the body of Christ if that were not so. Another of the every believer gifts is the gift of giving. That's not just given to rich people. We find that as Christ gives the illustration in, in the Gospels about the widow who gave her two mites. Never talk about the widow's mite. It's the widow's mite. She gave two mites uh, into the temple treasury. He says she's given more than all the rest because they give out of their abundance, but she's given out of her poverty. The gift of giving is something that you have. The question is, are you using it the way that God intended it to be used? God has entrusted you, as we prayed in the prayer this morning, he has entrusted you with certain stewardship. You are not an owner. You are a steward of what God has entrusted to your care. The question is, are you faithfully fulfilling your stewardship or are you wasting your master's resources as the unfaithful servant wasted his master's resources, was called in before the master, and the master said, you've got to give an account for your stewardship. Folks, someday you and I will give an account for our stewardship. What do you do with your time? Not merely with your money, though that's important. What do you do with your time? Are you wasting it? How do you spend it? Are you investing it? Are you investing it wisely? Or are you investing it in the things of this world? How about your relationships? Are you cultivating Christian friendships and are you building up weaker brothers in the faith so that they might be strong in their testimony. How about your family? Are you investing in them with the purpose not merely of having successful children? God has given me successful children, but I trust that the investment that I have made in their lives is a spiritual investment, not merely a temporal investment that will count for eternity. That is far more important. Better that they not have any skills or any knowledge of this world and that they should have a walk with Christ and that they should have all the honors that they've earned. You and I need to understand that whatever we have belongs to God. Because you see, when a man is a slave, he owns nothing of his of his self. If a man is a slave, everything he owns really belongs to his master. How are you using your home? Do you exercise Christian hospitality? Do you exercise the wonderful opportunity of bringing in others for fellowship in your home? There's so many different applications that we can see as we look at these New Testament gifts and what God has given to us that we should use for him. That's the every believer gifts. However, some are restricted gifts. Of these permanent gifts, these ones that still continue on today, they are given to only a few people in the body of Christ or to a limited number of men only. For example, the gift of pastor-teacher is never given to women. At the Dean Bergen Society meeting this week, I was having a time of fellowship with a pastor, Dr. David Cooper, and uh, he was telling about a, a woman uh, who had marched into his church um, one Sunday, and he introduced himself as, I am the pastor here, 
And she said, well, I'm Bishop so-and-so. And he said, oh, really? She said, yes, and God has given me a message to preach at your church today. <laughs> and he said, no, it's not going to happen. And she said, well, God told me that I have to do it. And he said, well, God didn't give me that same message, uh, and you're not going to do it. So she came in and sat down, uh, and through the service sat there with her arms crossed, and she said, if you don't let me preach today, I'll never come back. And he was hoping that would be the case. But she came back the next Sunday. She came back for six or seven weeks, and every week kept insisting that God had called her to preach in that church. Finally, it was around Christmas time, and uh, she came into the service with a tambourine. And as they were singing the Christmas carol, she began to wiggle and wave and bang the tambourine around. And um, so uh, the pastor whispered to the song leader, we'll just choose the really slow Christmas carols. But she continued to do it. So he walked down and said to her, you can't uh, do that here. She said, I can worship God any way I want. Uh, he said, well, you can, but not here. And uh, she continued to do it. So the pastor went out and called the police. And uh, uh, then came back in, and after the service was over, and, and they said, well, if she continues to cause trouble, give us another call, because he told them, don't come now and interrupt the service. So after the service, they were going to have a um, fellowship dinner. So he went up to her and invited her to the dinner. And she says, I don't have to do what you tell me to do. He said, well, I'm not telling you. I'm just inviting you if you'd like to come. And uh, then she started to carry on and make a loud ruckus, and... So uh, they called the police. They were there within 30 seconds. Apparently they'd been sitting in the parking lot just waiting if anything happened. And the policeman came in. And he said to her, uh, Mrs. So-and-so, um, have you done these following things? And he listed what the pastor had uh, told him. She said, yes, I have the right to worship as I please. And he said the same thing as the pastor had said. He says, well, that may be true, ma'am, but not here. And she said, well, uh, I'll do it if I want. And he said, well, now, you seem to be a, a, an intelligent woman, so let me explain to you that you have two options. Your first option is to pick up your things here and leave quietly. The second option is if you refuse to do so, I will go to the judge and get a warrant for your arrest, and I will take you away. And so she got up and walked out. Uh, folks, the New Testament makes, makes it very clear that no woman was ever given the gift of pastor-teacher. It just doesn't happen because it is one of the leadership gifts in the church. It is one of the gifts whereby uh, the congregation, including the men, is to be trained. And it is not the position of women to train the men, certainly not in the theological matters that are so necessary and which are expounded through that particular gift, the gift of pastor-teacher. So there are certain gifts that are restricted gifts only to a few people or some are limited even to men only. But as we look at these permanent service gifts, they are all supernatural and not merely natural. That's why they're called spiritual gifts by the Greek text. Very important to understand that because some folks with natural gifts, for example, in the area of teaching, may insist that they have, therefore, the gift of teacher. That may not necessarily be so. There are natural gifts, which even unsaved people will have, and there are supernatural gifts, which are the gifts of the Spirit that are listed for us in the New Testament. That's similar to the Old Testament responsibilities of service. Remember, we're talking about your new job, the job that gave to, God gave to Moses, and we see some parallels between what is going on with the service of the priests, for example, in the Old Testament, and our job is to know the will of God as it is set forth in the word of God and then to serve with what God has given us. We're not to be jealous of someone else who has a different gift. And gifts are not better than other gifts. In fact, Paul explains sometimes the more humble gifts, the ones that are not quite so flashy, are the more necessary gifts so that we might build up and edify the body of Christ. What we need to do is study the scriptures concerning those gifts and discover what it is that God has given to us 
so that we might serve the body of Christ. I think that a lot of times the reason that we do not serve as we should, and we've gone over a great deal of that, you know, in our Old Testament messages, um, a great deal of the service gifts that God has given aren't exercised because people do not know what their gifts are. And as a result, they do not function in them. In the Old Testament, only a select few were priests and Levites, but all of them had the responsibility of serving God in one way or another. Now, I want to talk today about the gift of evangelist, first of all, a little more detail. Uh, this is not what you see in Arminian circles, whereby they sweat it out of the people and make them pound the sawdust trail and come down to the front by putting a guilt trip on them and telling them all kinds of sad stories about people who died. Uh, the Arminian view is that it's up to the evangelist to drag people to the front. The Calvinist view is that God, in his sovereignty and by his own choice and according to his own purpose and pleasure, has those whom he calls the elect. And the elect are those whom God irresistibly draws through the proclamation of the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word. Our responsibility is the proclamation of the word, not the proclamation of human ideas, but the proclamation of scripture. And then God, by his spirit, penetrates the impregnable heart, penetrates the dead spirit where there is no life, and through the word of God, which is the seed that God sows in the heart, brings forth life through faith in Christ alone as we've spoken of earlier. It's a false view, the Arminian view. Uh, it's very aggressive. It assumes that if you just put enough pressure on, you will somehow make converts. But God has elected and guaranteed salvation and security to those who are the elect. He uses men whom he has gifted to proclaim the word of God and through the word of God draw them to Christ. The Holy Spirit uses the word to regenerate the elect. Now the term or the word evangelist occurs only three times in the New Testament. It literally means the good messenger, just like the gospel means the good news, the good message. We find the three occurrences in Acts 21 verse 8 where it's speaking of Philip the evangelist. It's used in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 where it is listed as one of the four leadership gifts in the church and it is listed in 2 Timothy, or it is mentioned in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 5, where Paul exhorts young Timothy, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry, reprove, exhort, and so on. So the gift of evangelist, though not mentioned many times, is mentioned in three highly critical contexts in the New Testament. It's very closely related to the word euangelizo, which is the word for the gospel. And that is the content of the message uh, that is preached by the evangelist. It is one of the speaking gifts. It is therefore not a gift for women. It's not just a silent Christian presence, although we should all always have a Christian presence wherever we are. The content of the gospel preached is a well-defined body of truth in the New Testament, promoting doctrinal content that covers far more than just the plan of salvation. The exercise of this gift must always be in the power of the Spirit. There are carnal men and carnal women uh, who are running around proclaiming themselves to be evangelists. Well, we all have the responsibility of sharing the gospel of Christ, but that doesn't mean that you have the gift of evangelist, which today perhaps we would say more falls along the lines of a church planting missionary, someone who goes into virgin territory where the gospel has never been proclaimed and who shares the good news of Christ, and we see that's what Philip was doing all the way from Acts chapter 8 until Acts chapter 21, where he is spoken of as uh, Philip the evangelist who had four daughters, we find that it took him 19 years to go from Azotus, Ashdod, modern Ashdod, all the way up to Caesarea Philippi, where he is found when we get to chapter 21. That's a, a space of about 55 miles. It took him 19 years to go 55 miles. He had evangelized along the way, the text tells us. What was he doing? He was leading people to Christ, and he was planting them into Bible-preaching churches as he moved along, and as the church became established, he would move on. 
And God would raise up, normally from the church, and we'll talk about this in a moment, would normally raise up from the churches planted by the evangelist, or the church planter, we would say, uh, he would raise up men with the gift of pastor-teacher. He would define a body of elders with the necessary gifts and the necessary qualifications. If you were with us on Sunday evenings, you know we went over all the qualifications for elders and all the qualifications for deacons. And then from among them, God would raise up men who would have the gift of pastor-teacher to care for that assembly. But I get off my point here. The exercise of the gift must always be in the power of the spirit, not in the power of the flesh. There are those who try to exercise it in the flesh. And when it is so done, it is always effective since it is the Holy Spirit who uses the word of God and regenerates the dead spirits in men. The gift of evangelists, like all the other spiritual gifts, is directed to the members of the body, specifically to the unsaved elect. Thus, evangelism done on the basis of false theology contradicts, and that's very important, contradicts all of the spiritual gifts and their proper exercise. All the apostles obviously had that gift. You see them church planting throughout the New Testament, as they had all the other gifts as well. But the gift of evangelists is a distinct spiritual gift. They have to function in, term, in terms of God's order of priorities. We find it's a leadership gift in Ephesians 4.11. Evangelists have to set the example in their home life as well. And we see that Philip did that. He was having a normal home life. He had four virgin daughters who prophesied. We'll talk about that when we get to the gift of prophet. But Philip obviously had a normal family life as well. He was not somebody who just jetted all over the globe and left his family in the lurch and paid no attention to them. He was a man who had a normal family life as well. In Acts chapter 8, we see that he was one of the seven deacons. Excuse me, Acts chapter 6, one of the seven deacons in Acts chapter 6 and verse 5. When we studied the office of deacon, you recall that it said a man who uses the office of a deacon well gains to himself a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. Very interesting word, that word, a good degree, because it means a step on an ascending staircase. He begins to move up in his responsibilities in the church. And we saw that it was from the men who were in the office of deacon that elders were chosen as they demonstrated themselves faithful in temporal matters. God gave them further responsibility in spiritual matters. Folks, it's important to study the New Testament. Did you know that? Important to learn what God says so that you can imitate it as we see the pattern that is given to us here in the doctrinal epistles. And so we find God giving him that responsibility for the widows and the orphans, serving tables, which the apostles finally found was too much for them to do. They said they would give themselves continually to the word of God and to prayer. And the seven men who were chosen had to be full of the Holy Ghost and of wisdom, whom we may appoint over this matter. It wasn't because they were the best businessmen in the community. It wasn't because they were the richest men in the church. It was because they were full of the Holy Ghost and full of wisdom. We need to learn to use God's standards rather than man's standards in the appointment of church leadership. Other New Testament evangelists Clearly, we see that from the work that they are doing because it's defined for us in the three passages which I mentioned a moment ago. Paul obviously had that gift. Barnabas, Timothy, Silas, Mark, who was a kinsman of Barnabas, Titus, and Tychicus on the third journey. It speaks of him doing this kind of work. It's a man who preaches the gospel, a man who teaches converts, a man who establishes congregation, a man who exercises watchful care, prayer, and faith, a man who is prepared through the study of the word and an apprenticeship and has authority of an elder over heretics. That moves us to the gift of pastor-teacher. How am I doing on time? I tell you what, we've only got five minutes and I will never cover the gift of pastor-teacher uh, in the next five minutes. So I think I'll stop with that, but just remember, there are gifts that are still given and if you have trusted Christ as your savior, you do not have any of the charismatic gifts, using that term as it's commonly used today. 
you do not have any of the temporary sign gifts that were given prior to the completion of the New Testament scriptures. But you do have at least one of those 15 gifts, which I mentioned a few moments ago. You have at least one. I believe you have at least two. And you probably have more than that so that you might edify, that is, you might build up the body of Christ. My responsibility, as explained in Ephesians chapter 4, as well as the responsibility of the evangelist and the pastor teacher, is to edify the saints, to build up the saints so that they might do the work of the ministry. The work of the ministry is not merely what the pastor does. The work of the ministry, a word which means service, is the responsibility of every member of the body. Every joint in the body supplies something, Paul explains in Ephesians 4, so that the body will be strong, just like the bones are joined together with the, the muscles and with the tendons and with the nerves and with the blood system. Every member is necessary so that the body will be strong and healthy and be able to exercise its responsibility to spread the gospel to the lost world. Let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you, Father, even though perhaps some of these things we have not heard or thought about or organized in our thinking. But each of us has responsibilities to serve you. And you have not only commanded it, but you have enabled us and empowered us just as you did Moses. He had a different job to do. He had to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt and into the promised land. And so you gave him some miraculous signs there at the beginning. The leprous hand, the rod that turned into a serpent, the ten plagues of Egypt to demonstrate that you were doing a new work. With these who were the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you were calling forth a people to be a nation. You parted the Red Sea for them. You brought them through the wilderness and the rock gave its water and the manna came down from heaven. But after Moses was taken and the children of Israel went into the promised land, the manna ceased after that first crop. Father, help us to understand that as with Joshua and the children of Israel, there are still, still spiritual wars to fight. They have the giants of the land with whom they had to contend. We have the giants in the land with whom we have to contend, and you likewise empower us and enable us, though in a different manner than you did with Moses, so that we might fulfill the call that you have placed upon our lives, the Great Commission, that you have sent us into all the world to preach the gospel to every creature, that as with the apostles, they began at their Jerusalem, and then Judea, and then Samaria, and then the uttermost parts of the earth. So too you have called us to preach the good news, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. You've gifted and enabled us so that we might function not merely individually as lone rangers, but you've given us gifts so that we might function corporately as a body of believers, building one another up and seeing growth, both spiritual and numerical, in this body. You've gathered us into local churches and you've called us to send forth that good news which you have entrusted to us as stewards, and someday we will have to give an account for our stewardship, not merely the money that we've had, though you've given that to us, but everything else, and especially the spiritual riches, the treasures that we have in Christ Jesus. We pray, Father, that you will make us faithful, that you will make us diligent, that you will make us obedient, that you will make us a holy and pure people, for we are indwelt by your Holy Spirit looking for the blessed hope, even the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior who loved us and gave himself for us, our Lord Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray.